Welcome to the Anatomy and Physiology 1 series on the skin or the integumentary system. Remember that the integumentary system includes the cutaneous membrane or the skin as well as all of the accessory structures that are associated with the skin. For example, the hair, the nails, the glands that release oil and sweat onto the skin surface. Today we're going to quickly go through this model of the integumentary system. The cutaneous membrane itself, or the skin itself, is divided into two major regions, the epidermis and the dermis. The dermis is this region that you see right here. Okay? Above all of this yellow fat or adipose tissue, all the way up to this curvy line that you see here. So this again is the dermis, the major layer of the skin or cutaneous membrane. Above the dermis, we have the epidermis. Epi is above, so epidermis above the dermis. Again, from this curvy line, distinct curvy line that we see, all the way up to the surface of the skin, the exposed surface of the skin, is the epidermis. We see that the epidermis is different in the two types of skin that we have. We have thick skin on the palms of our hands and soles of our feet, which is a tougher, thicker skin because our feet and hands are stressed a lot more than the rest of our skin. And you can see that by looking at your hand. It's tougher, it's thicker, it has calluses on it. So when we look at the model and we're trying to determine if it's thick skin or thin skin, we can look for two different features. One. In thick skin, we have a thick top layer, or stratum corneum. Stratum just means layer. Okay, we have a thick stratum corneum, as opposed to a thin stratum corneum in thin skin. Also, in thick skin, we have an extra layer in the epidermis. You see this yellow line here? This yellow line is showing you the stratum lucidum. Okay, when we look at thin skin, there is no yellow line. There is no stratum lucidum. Okay, so thick skin has an extra layer in the epidermis. It actually has five layers in the epidermis. And it has a thick stratum corneum, or top layer. Speaking of the layers in the epidermis, the epidermis is broken up into either four or five layers of cells. These cells are called keratinocytes. Okay? because they're cells that get keratinized or packed with keratin. When we look at the layers in the epidermis, we'll start at the very bottom layer and we'll say that that layer is called the stratum basal. Okay? It's on the base or bottom of the epidermis, so it's easy to remember. Okay? Filled with basal cells that continuously divide. So this single dark layer on the bottom here is the stratum basal. Next up, we have a layer called the stratum spinosum. Okay. Then we see that the model gets a little bit lighter as we go up, and this area right here that's almost more gray or white is the stratum granulosum. Okay. So all skin, thin skin and thick skin, have those layers, the stratum basal, the stratum spinosum, the stratum granulosum. Okay. Next, in thick skin, we have the stratum lucidum. Again, we do not have that in thin skin. And then the final, most superficial layer, the layer on the top of the skin, is the stratum corneum. Okay, and that's this thick area here, or this thin area here in thin skin. Okay, so those are the layers of the epidermis. We said that the epidermis and dermis have this curved line between them. Okay, the reason for this curved line is to increase the surface area between the two layers so that they can be bound together more tightly. When we look at this curved line, we see that there are parts of the epidermis that extend down into the dermis. Each of these little projections, each of these little fingers that reach down is an epidermal ridge. So epidermal ridge, epidermal ridge, epidermal ridge. The parts of the dermis that reach up into the epidermis are called dermal papilla. Okay, and that's with an A-E on the end. 
And that's going to be very important because we see that there's another structure that's spelled the exact same way without the E on the end. Okay. So going down to the dermis, we have our dermal papilla that stick up. And this dermis is split into two regions, two layers. The thin top region of the dermis from about here up, okay, so this small little area, is the papillary layer or papillary region. It's the part that has these dermal papilla. Okay, so dermal papilla are in the papillary region. The bigger, deeper part of the dermis is the reticular layer or reticular region. When we look beneath the cutaneous membrane, we have the cutaneous membrane or skin with the epidermis and the dermis. Beneath this cutaneous membrane, we have this area right here. We call this area the hypodermis. Hypo means below, so the below the dermis, hypodermis. We also call this area the subcutaneous layer because remember, this is the cutaneous membrane. So beneath the cutaneous membrane is subcutaneous. Sub is below, just like the subway goes below the ground. When we look at this hypodermis or subcutaneous layer, we see that we've got lots of these yellow globules here. This is showing us adipose tissue or fat tissue. That's where all of the fat and lipids are stored beneath your skin. When we look at this region, we also see that we've got big blood vessels coming in. And you'll notice that's what we see in blue and red. You'll notice that we also see these blood vessels up here scattered throughout the dermis, but that they end, they stop at the top of the dermis. These blood vessels do not enter the epidermis because the epidermis is avascular. It does not have a direct blood supply. So that's the, that's the, the overall um, explanation or overall gist of the cutaneous membrane and its basic layers, the epidermis, the dermis, and the hypodermis. When we look at the cutaneous membrane, um, we see all of these associated structures, okay, all of these accessory structures that are associated with the skin. When we look at all of these accessory structures, we see that they start down deep in the skin. They start either in the dermis or hypodermis. And then they often extend up through the epidermis. The reason that these structures start down in the dermis is because we have a blood supply here. These are living, functioning, working cells. So they need oxygen and glucose to be brought to them. They need their waste products to be carried away. So that's why we have them down here in the dermis where we have plenty of blood supply. So looking at the accessory structures, we'll start with the hair. Each one of these brown structures is showing you a hair. Again, you see that it starts down deep in the dermis and extends up and out past the epidermis, which is why you can see your hair on the outside of your body. When we look at the hair, we can break it up into a couple main portions or parts. The root of the hair is the part that's below the surface just like the roots of a tree are beneath the ground. This part that extends out past the epidermis is the shaft. So the shaft and the root. When we look at the base of each hair, we see this swollen area here, the part where it gets a little bit wider. That's the bulb, the hair bulb. Just like a bulb, a tulip bulb, looks just like this. When we look at the very base of the hair here, you see this little notch or this little opening where we have blood vessels feeding into the hair. That is the papilla with an A on the end. Okay, it's a dermal papilla or a hair papilla with just an A on the end. And that's where we have the hair matrix with all of these living dividing cells that allow the hair to be pushed up and to grow. That's where we have a blood supply there because they're living cells. Once we extend up this way, the hair becomes just dead cells with lots of keratin in them. And that's why it doesn't hurt when you cut your hair or style your hair because it's not actually living anymore. 
It's just this part down here that's allowing the hair to grow that's living. So we have the papilla at the bottom, okay? this swollen area is the bulb, the part underneath the surface is the root, and the part that sticks out is the shaft. You see surrounding the outside of the hair, we have a hair follicle. And the follicle is actually made up of epidermal cells. You see that it's the same color as these epidermal cells? Because during development, these epidermal cells actually extend down into the dermis to form this hair follicle. Also, associated with the hair, we see that we have this, this red structure over here, and this is a muscle. This is called the erector pili muscle. And when this erector pili muscle contracts, it makes your hair stand up on end. You'll notice that that happens when you're very cold and also when you're scared. You hear people say, you know, when they were really scared, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. Well, that's true, that really happens. And also when you're cold and you get goosebumps, your hair stands up. And that's a leftover evolutionary trait because in animals that have hair all over their body, when they're cold and their hair stands up on end, their hair is a better insulator. It's a better coat to keep them warm. Also, when they're scared and the hair that's all over their body stands up on end, they look bigger and scarier so that they're less likely to be attacked. So that's why we have this erector pili muscle that makes our hair stand up. Also associated with the hairs, you see these blue structures here. These blue structures here are glands. They're exocrine glands that make secretions or fluids that we secrete onto the body. These glands associated with the hairs here happen to be glands called sebaceous glands. And sebaceous glands make something called sebum, which is oil. So you see that they're associated with the hair. These sebaceous glands produce oil and release it onto the hair. And that's why if you don't wash your hair for a few days, it gets oily. This, um, the purpose of this oil is to one, lubricate, but also it's got antibacterial properties to help prevent bacterial infections from occurring in here. We also have a couple other types of glands. We have two different types of sweat glands. These smaller white glands with these long ducts that come up to the surface of the skin are showing you eccrine sweat glands, eccrine. And these are the typical sweat glands that you think of. When you get sweaty, you have this salty sweat all over your body to try and cool your body down. These are the glands that are making that sweat, these eccrine glands. This here is showing us a different type of sweat gland. This is an apocrine sweat gland. And apocrine glands produce a type of sweat that um, it's a little bit smellier of a sweat and it's got pheromones in it. So these are located only in areas that have hair that starts to develop at puberty. So the underarms, the groin. So these glands, they don't cool us down. Okay? These apocrine sweat glands have to do with attracting the opposite sex. And they only become active at puberty because before puberty, we don't need that to occur. So you can tell the difference between oil glands or sebaceous glands and sweat glands because the sweat glands have a much longer duct. They release their secretions through a long duct. These eccrine sweat glands that cool us down release straight onto the surface of the skin through a sweat pore. So this little hole here, or these ones shown on the top, are showing you pores. Now, this apocrine sweat gland can release directly onto the surface like this, or this long duct can go to a hair. Okay, so don't be confused if you see this gland with a duct that goes towards a hair. You can tell the difference between the apocrine gland and the sebaceous gland because this apocrine gland will have a longer duct. Even if it's going to a hair, it will have a longer duct. Whereas you see these sebaceous oil glands are really, really just, they're really closely associated with the hair itself. Okay. So the last thing that we'll talk about are the touch receptors that we have down here in the dermis. Okay. When you use your hands to touch things, you get all sorts of different sensations. 
You can sense pressure. You can sense pain, temperature. You can sense texture. You can grasp um, or sense how, how hard you're grasping something. Your hands have lots of receptors in them. Your skin in general has lots of receptors in it. Okay. These are nervous system type, um, type structures that send a message to our brain that tells us what it is that we're feeling. The two different types of receptors that we'll look at right now are called tactile corpuscles and lamellated or pacinian corpuscles. These tiny little white rods that you see up at the very top of the dermis, these are called tactile corpuscles. Those give us information about light touch. Deeper down here, we see these bigger structures that are called lamellated or lamellar corpuscles. They're also called pacinian corpuscles. These are the ones that actually look like an onion. You see all of these rings in it? They look like an onion. And you'll notice that both of these, the tactile corpuscles and the pacinian corpuscles, have this little attachment here. These little attachments are going to neurons that are located deeper in the body. Okay? So that when this is compressed, we know that we're touching something, we're pushing on something, and this tactile corpuscle will fire a signal down to the neuron, which will send a signal up the spinal cord into the brain so that we know that we're touching something. So that summarizes what you guys are going to need to know for the integumentary system. Thank you, and next we'll do the skeletal system.